Welcome to the show. This is Arun Gupta, your friendly host. Today, we are here to talk about Java EE 7. But first, let's try to understand what are the key tenets of Java EE. First of all, Java EE is built in an open and transparent manner that really allows community, people like you, to actively engage and participate. Java EE also provides a complete solution in the sense whether you're looking for transactions, security, dependency injection, or any web tier technologies, Java EE has all of it. Now, Java EE technologies also allow you to solve point problems using individual technologies, but it works beautifully in a very cohesive manner to seamlessly solve your real world problems. Java EE also takes write once, run anywhere promise of Java to the next level where you can build your applications using Java EE and deploy them on a wide variety of application servers. Let me give you a quick overview of how the show is going to run. We have strategy keynote followed by a technical keynote where you'll hear all the technical details accompanied by code intensive demos. After the keynote, we have breakout sessions where the specification leads will provide a lot more detail about each technology. There are scheduled chat sessions where again the speakers are waiting to answer your questions. And of course, we are monitoring the hashtag Java EE 7. We are waiting to hear your passion on what you like about Java EE and what you're learning in the webinar. Now, if you are like me and you want to eat your dessert before the main course, go download the Java EE 7 SDK at oracle.com slash Java EE. With that, I would like to introduce Hassan Rizvi, Executive Vice President at Oracle for Middleware Development. Thank you, Arun. So over the last couple of years, we've really been focusing on what does it take to make the future Java? And when we say the future Java, we mean two things. How do we create the next generation Java platform, as well as the process by which we do that? Now, at the high level, there are three areas I want to address from a platform perspective. We want to fill in any and all gaps to make the platform complete. This is really about making sure that Java works everywhere and for everyone. This is a broad topic that incorporates everything from adherence to standards to accessibility technology. We are also driving innovation into the platform. As the largest software platform, the industry depends on Java to extend important innovations to its broad development community. Now, at the same time, developer productivity is a constant theme that permeates everything. For employers and managers, this is about lowering the cost of developing and maintaining products and services. For developers, it's about being able to express themselves with as little unnecessary overhead as possible. Now, from a process perspective, it's not only what you do with Java, but also how you get there. In many ways, Java pioneered the concept of open collaborative evolution, and this is the key to its initial success. Companies have bet their future on Java and developers their careers. We owe all these constituents a transparent roadmap so that they can plan ahead and a chance to help Java evolve in directions that are important to them, knowing that the Java skills they're investing in are transferable across the platforms so they can take advantage of the many different platforms without having to learn new skills. Now that means you can do more with Java than you've ever thought possible. Finally, quality and security are top priorities that permeate everything we do. Oracle takes these two very seriously because they are critical to our business and because they are critical to the entire Java community. Now recently, vulnerabilities affecting Java SE have received a lot of public attention. And we've done a lot of effort to address those. However, a vast majority of these issues impact one specific Java use case, Java running in web browsers. A large number of Java programs run on the servers and data centers and as applications on the desktop computers. These Java programs are not affected by most of the vulnerabilities identified recently. Let's look at the platform a little bit more. Java is the foundation for virtually every type of network application and is the global standard for developing and delivering embedded and mobile applications, web-based content and enterprise software. The breadth of the platform, its rich features, low cost, maturity, and application portability maximize developer opportunity. We've got, of course, Java SE, Java Embedded, Java FX, and Java EE. Let's look at each one of them in a little bit more detail. Now, Java SE released JDK 7 in 2011. It's now supported by nearly all Oracle products, as well as good uptake in the industry. 
We've added support for Mac OS X as well as Linux ARM. JDK 8 is making good progress, adding new innovative features uh, such as programming for multi-core. Even as of last August, as you can see from the chart, we are seeing massive adoption of Java SE, and you can see how rapidly releases are becoming standard. We also released Java FX 2 in 2011, reinvigorating the Java client for the broader Java community, increasing uptake in several segments of the industry, as a next generation replacement for Swing and SWT for developing interactive desktop applications. We've seen a lot of positive adoption of JavaFX, both in the developer community, as well as with established enterprises, such as these you see in a variety of verticals. QuantCell for data analytics, HealthCon in healthcare, Seller trading applications, and Navis, which is cargo and commerce. Java Embedded has been another area that we focused a lot of our attention over the last couple of years, really driving the device to data center strategy aimed at providing a standard development platform for the Internet of Things. We introduced a broad range of products spanning from Java ME for sensors and other microcontroller-based devices through Java SE Embedded for gateways and concentrators to Java Embedded Suite, which is a complete middleware stack for high-end IoT gateways. We formed key partnership with companies like Qualcomm and Freescale, uh, and uh, we've seen significant market interest. Java ME will move to a generic small footprint platform with Oracle investing towards enabling edge devices in the Internet of Things. Java Card will continue in its role as a secure operating system for smart cards, but also expand to be a security layer for any type of client, including for embedded clients. Now, today we are very excited to announce Java Enterprise Edition 7. We are committed to Java EE, not just by leading Java EE 7, but also in the products that Oracle delivers. This platform is a culmination of work by all of us, Oracle, our Java partners, and of course you, the Java community. All of this would not have been possible without our key partners and their contributions. So for that, I wanted to take a moment to thank our Java EE partners for their ongoing contributions and support of the platform. You truly make Java possible, and our executives, staff, development teams, and broad community thank you for your contributions and efforts. But what is it that we've built together? I know this is what you've all been waiting for. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Cameron Purdy, Vice President of Development, to tell us more about the platform. Cameron, congratulations. Thank you, Hassan. So, in addition to this uh, great set of partners who have contributed to uh, the Java platform and Java EE7, uh, we also have a wonderful and innovative program that we started a few years ago with the Java community. Java user groups all around the world have taken ownership of specific JSRs, and this is what we call the Adopt a JSR program. What this does is it allows our Java user groups to participate and pick a particular standard that they want to contribute to, um, and uh, through the Adopt a JSR program, we've had uh, tremendous input into Java EE 7. First to Sun, and now over the uh, past few years as part of Oracle, uh, we've demonstrated uh, leadership uh, of the uh, Java EE platform and also stewardship for it, uh, 15 years running now. And uh, together what we've uh, been able to do, both uh, here and with our community and with our partners, is we've been able to continue to evolve, uh, invest in, and drive forward the platform, the Java EE platform, to keep it relevant to the needs of uh, application developers building enterprise applications. Starting with uh, J2EE, almost 15 years ago now, this was the first standard to ever actually address the needs of enterprise application development, the first standard that brought portability uh, and openness to enterprise applications. Starting with Java EE5 and continuing through today, we've focused on ease of development, things like context and dependency injection, uh, annotation-based development. And now with Java EE7, we're unveiling uh, today HTML5. This is the ultimate, ultimate platform for building HTML5 and mobile applications. So what have we created? Well, a couple of things. I mean, to start with, we have 9 million developers. This is the largest development community ever. Uh, Nine million developers that know how to use Java and contribute to, uh, contribute to building applications and contribute, uh, many of them contribute to these standards. Uh, also now we can announce 
18 compliant implementations of Java EE that are available, which means that applications built for this standard uh, can, can be used on, on many different platforms, uh, many different servers. Uh, so created all together, we've created a, a very successful uh, enterprise platform. Java EE 7 is a rich ecosystem, not just software vendors, but also consultancies and systems integrators. And many of these, Java EE has become a critical part of their business strategy. Let's hear from one of them today, Ravi Kumar from Infosys. We have 25,000 employees uh, working on Oracle technologies, transforming their businesses and building tomorrow's enterprise. All enterprise customers look at a combination of multi-channel, uh, web-based, cloud-enabled, or interconnected systems. And that combination needs these advantages with, which the J2E platform has. So clearly it is a strategic choice for us. The ability of the platform to create high developer productivity. High developer productivity comes from some features like uh, annotation-based programming. High developer productivity comes from the fact that the Java E platform actually focuses on infrastructure and integration part of the life cycle of uh, development and therefore allowing developers to free time for business logic and therefore it gives the developers an opportunity to create rapid de deployment and development cycles and reduce the total cost of ownership. The two things which strike me the most is the WebSocket as well as um, uh, the inbuilt uh, batch APIs. For the community of developers, for clients, for system integrators like Infosys, and um, Oracle has been a wonderful steward to Java. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ravi. As you can see, there's a lot of interest in Java EE7. And let's take a look at what, what's actually in Java EE7. We had three major themes. First, for HTML5, we're introducing support for two new standards. The first is WebSockets. So we now have WebSockets APIs in Java EE7 that allow clients and servers to communicate asynchronously with each other. Secondly, we're introducing support for JSON in Java EE7. And lastly, we're creating an asynchronous RESTful support that allows uh, a much higher scalability for REST-based applications. The second theme of Java EE7 is developer productivity. Java EE7 is a, a much more productive environment because it's a cohesive integrated platform. It allows a developer to take the skills that they know from one area of Java EE7 and apply those same skills across many areas and technologies. One of the ways that we do this is to eliminate significant amounts of boilerplate code through the use of annotation-based development. And this is a continuation of the work that we've done in Java EE 5 and 6. The third theme in Java EE 7 is support for enterprise scale applications. There are three parts of this. First, we introduce a new batch programming API. This allows applications to break down complex uh, jobs into smaller batch jobs. Secondly, we've introduced concurrency utilities based on Java SE concurrency that allow Java EE e applications to provide significantly higher throughput. And lastly, we have a major revision to the Java messaging specification. JMS 2.0 is new and part of Java EE 7. Today we have with us uh, Harish Grama from IBM. IBM was the specification lead for the new batch API in Java, and Harish is here to tell us a little bit more about that. Java EE has helped provide solutions to all of our small and large customers. In the past, we started off with Java SC, which had the promise of write once, run anywhere. But with Java EE, you truly get all the qualities of service that any enterprise application would need. Some of the things that we've done with Java EE is make it easier for programmers to consume the complex underlying capabilities of the platform through easy programmatic interfaces. And this, again, is key in order to get a larger community, ever-widening community of programmers to use Java EE for their application development needs. We've been in this business for well over 50 years, and right with our mainframes, people have been doing batch applications right through. As more and more people start to put their increasingly enterprise-ready, mission-critical apps on Java, 
uh, they naturally just came to us and said, you know, the one thing this is missing is batch applications in order to help online transaction programming. So IBM decided to jump in, take the lead, and define the standard, of course, with the community. Oracle and Sun together have made this a much more transparent process, have catered to the new emerging technologies uh, that are arising in this particular field. Now, this is key because previously people only saw the specification when it came out at the other end of the process, but now the people that are interested but not necessarily part of the group can watch it right through the process and can make the right comments and give the right suggestions to make it useful for the broadest part of the community. And this, I think, is key for innovation. Many thanks to IBM and Cameron. Java EE will not be the mega power it is today with just Oracle and its partners. It's a lot about the community around it. Let me show you why. Java EE 7 was a result of 14 active JSRs by 16 different specification leads. There were oh, about 200 experts from 32 different companies. Truly a global phenomenon. This was all done following the JCP transparency rules on 26 active projects on Java.net. That means the working draft of the specs were always available, publicly accessible expert group discussions, and even the publicly accessible issue tracker. Adopted JSR was a grassroots evangelism effort that allowed jugs to participate, and we'll talk about that in a second. Glossfish community is where the reference implementation for the Java E7 was built. There were 89 promoted builds, and all of that is now available as part of Java E7 SDK. Java is all about community, innovation, participation, and that is possible by you. You are the guys who help us build the momentum around Java E7. A big heartful thanks for helping us build this momentum. Speak up, be heard, make sure your voice is helping us shape the future of Java. Your innovation, your participation is what makes this really possible. We really want to hear you and listen to you and help us decide the future of Java. Adopted JSR is a grassroots evangelism effort that allows JUG members to participate early in the standardization process and help shape the JSR. There were 19 different Java user groups that participated in this process and contributed to all the major JSRs of the Java E7 platform. As part of this, they organized hackathons, built end-to-end -end sample applications. They presented on different Java E7 technologies all around the world. And in the as a result, they filed bugs, they gave feedback helping formulate the JSR. I worked with each one of you to participate in this process, and I really enjoyed it. Next launch, I would like to see your jug participating in this effort. Now, even though Java E7 is done, but we will continue to work with you to help us define what feature set should be coming in the next release. Classfish community is where the reference implementation of Java E7 is built. Developers all around the world downloaded nightly promoted builds of the reference implementation and filed about 100 bugs, together helping us build a better platform. Once again, thank you very much for helping us build a better platform for everybody. Java Magazine is a free digital magazine that provides Java how-tos, news from the community, news about new books, events, and conferences, and much more. I know most of you subscribe to the magazine. What you may not know is 60% of the content is actually generated by you. And 80% of you actually consider it a must-read. The latest issue of the Java Magazine is focused on Java EE 7 with lots of content from the community once again. I highly encourage you to subscribe to the magazine and even think about contributing an article next time. And now I'll turn back to Cameron, who will introduce our next guest. Thank you, Arun. What an amazing community. It's uh, amazing the contributions we have from across a diverse community and uh, companies uh, of all sizes. Uh, we've already seen and heard from a, a number of uh, large companies and uh, also the community itself contributing to Java EE7. And with us today, we also have an uh, up-and-coming company, a uh, longtime consumer of Java EE and contributor to Java EE, LifeRay. And with me today, I have Michael Hahn from LifeRay. Welcome, sure. Michael. Thank you, Cameron. 
So tell me a little bit about yourself and about, about LifeRay. Well, um, LifeRay, well, we were founded about almost over a dozen years ago. Uh, originally, our chief architect had wanted to build uh, a cost-effective solution for nonprofits to create web solutions. And you know, now we fast forward 12 years, and we've seen the tremendous growth uh, where you know, we're now one of the leaders in the Java portal space. Uh, it's just been a fantastic ride. So I actually come from a financial background. So I used to do a lot of uh, low latency trading and all that fun stuff. And when Brian asked me to come on board, I was like, well, get out of finance. Let's go back into software. So it's been interesting. Excellent. So what, uh, what does Java EE, what role does that play uh, in LifeRay? Well, I mean, from the day one, our product was built on top of you know, EE components, right? So servlets, EJBs, all that fun stuff. And it continues to pr provide a huge uh, platform for us. You know, we're one of the few products out there that can run on a, a variety of servers. And that's all being facilitated by the fact that you know, Java EE is an industry specification that has so many participants in it. So what um, what does it mean for your customers? I mean, do they even know your Java EE? What <laughs> why does it translate for them? Well, for them, it's really about no longer worrying about you know how, all the different plumbing that Java EE already pro provides for them, right? So instead of worrying about how do I do transactions, security, all that stuff, don't worry about it. Let's figure out how do you actually r deliver the right solution to your customers and the right business value, and leave the plumbing to the rest of the folks who write application servers. So from our perspective, you know, we leverage upon that, that concept, and our customers are basically der deriving the same values so that they can actually say, hey, you know what? My infrastructure is Oracle, great. My infrastructure is IBM, no problem. You are able to deliver the right solutions without worrying about what your vendor is doing. So today we uh, talked a lot about the Java community. What, what does that mean for LifeRay and uh, for everything you guys are doing? Well, I mean, as a Java product, obviously, if the language is not strong, the community is not there, you know, our product's not going to be very valuable to the, to the business community. So from that perspective, you know, we absolutely must have a very strong Java community, very engaged developers, and we derive a lot of technical in innovation from the community as well. So from that perspective, um, you know, we want to make sure that the Java community stays strong, stays relevant, uh, so that there's plenty of developers out there, not only to adopt our software, but hopefully, you know, the really good developers can come in and join us as well. Right. So speaking of technical innovation, uh, I've heard that that you guys are taking a lead on a project called LifeRay Faces. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what it what it has to do with the uh, Java EE? Yeah, absolutely. So LifeRay Faces came about uh, in collaboration with some of our community members, actually. So there's a, a large number of folks who use JSF to facilitate development of user interfaces. But unfortunately, JSF and portals didn't really play along very well until, of course, the specifications for portlet bridges came about for JSF portlet bridges. Hmm. So we actually uh, adopted a project called um, well, Phases Bridge, which actually creates a bridge between JSF technology and, of course, portals as well. So now it makes it easier for developers to use JSF, but also in the portal world. And on top of that, you know, JSF is all about giving better user experience to the, to the users, but also allowing developers to leverage their back-end technologies. So from that perspective, we're also creating um, a, a toolkit called Faces Alloy Faces, which leverages uh, our mobile, mobile compliant uh, user interface toolkits, especially for the JavaScript and CSS, et cetera. Uh, and of course, they're all HTML5 compliant, but allows the JSF developers to leverage those components uh, without worrying about you know, how do I code HTML5 or, J or JavaScript. Right. Now, you mentioned mobile, HTML5. I mean, a lot of the work we did in Java EE7 that we looked at today had to do with uh, HTML5. How, does, how do these standards in Java EE7 lend themselves to work you're doing in the mobile space? Well, we're really excited about the mobile aspect because especially around the web sockets portion. Um, if you look at technology prior to Java EE7, you had to kind of pick and choose. Right. So if you're folks who want to adopt XMPP, great, let's go with Bosch, right? Or folks who want to use Comet, et cetera. But there was no single standard across the board. So as an application vendor, we always had to go out and try to figure out, okay, what's our customers using? Are they using Comet? Are they using Bosch? What's the most popular one? Now with a standard platform across the board, we can actually focus on delivering WebSocket-based applications targeted towards, of course, the mobile devices. Right. And now without having to worry about the different technologies underneath. That's pretty cool. So on top of Java EE 7, what are some of the things you can see doing in the future? What are some of the things you can build on top of that? Well, uh, the biggest thing right now looking for us is certainly the mobile applications web sockets. So being able to deliver more real-time interfaces, especially you know, for everybody who's on their phone, on their tablets, they're able to be connected to their back-end systems in a much more real-time fashion. But of course, beyond that, um, you know, we're really excited about the Portlet 3 specification going into the works. And a lot of that is certainly is built on top of the foundations, Java EE7 as well. 
That's great. Thanks, Michael. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So if you want to get started today rolling with Java EE, download it today from oracle.com forward slash Java EE. This comes with a Java EE 7 tutorial and a number of samples for our new capabilities in Java EE 7. We also have online education available uh, from oracle.education.oracle.com forward slash Java. And lastly, the fun's only starting. We have events coming to a location near you. Follow us online for more information. So this concludes our Java EE 7 strategy keynote. Up next, we have the Java EE 7 technical keynote. Thank you. People are disappearing. Someone is out there. Someone who wants to destroy us. You've got to run. No. I've got to fight back. You are the masters of Java. They want to wipe out your language. It is too powerful. Their inferior language will become obsolete. I know where they are. We can't do this alone. It's the only way. It's our language, it's our power, it's our future. Let's take it back. I am the future of Java. I am the future of Java. Where is it? Welcome to the technical keynote. I have great pleasure to introduce Linda DiMichel, the Java EE platform specification lead. Thank you, Arun. So Linda, what are the themes for Java EE 7? Well, as Cameron just mentioned, there are three major themes of Java EE 7. Delivering HTML5 dynamic, scalable applications, increasing developer productivity through simplification and new container services, and meeting the additional demands of the enterprise by adding new enterprise technologies. We'll be exploring all of these aspects in more detail in the context of the new Java E7 APIs as we continue this presentation. So tell us, what is the first thing in the HTML5 theme then? Well, JSON. JSON is a key technology for data transfer within HTML5 applications. With JSON 1.0, Java EE 7 adds new APIs to enable the parsing and generation of JSON texts and objects. There are two forms that these APIs take. A streaming API, which is a low-level, highly efficient, event-driven API for the parsing and generation of JSON text, similar to stacks in the XML world. The streaming API generates events such as start object, start array, key name, value string. And more conveniently, there is an easy to use, higher level, object level API for mapping JSON text into JSON objects and arrays, similar to the DOM API in the XML world. Arun, can you show us the demo? Sure. In this demo, I'll show you how easy it is to access the results from any public JSON data structure. In the browser, what I'm showing you, if I make a query on all public posts for the keyword Java, this is a JSON structure that is returned from the Facebook API. And I will show you how to parse this data structure and get just the poster name and the actual message from the poster. What you're looking at is how you're going to 
implement this using streaming search API, for example. So here, and I'm using the same URL, I'm reading the data from the Facebook API, then the streaming parser is going to generate different events for me, as you said. In this case, the event that I'm interested in is in key name. So show me the, or tell me when the particular key name, which is name or message, occurs. As soon as that occurs, I switch on that, and then I tell the parser to give me the value, and then I just print it out. So if I have to run this code here, I right click here, and I say run file. It's going to go query the Facebook API, get the JSON results, do my parser, and here you can see the results are returned. Now let's see how we can do the same thing using the object model API as well. Same thing in object model API. We actually query the, or we connect to the URL. We create our reader here. JSON reader is what we create. Now from the JSON reader, we read an object. This is the entire JSON object that I read. And then from the object, once it's there with me, I can index into the different elements. You know, okay, give me the data array, give me the message, give me the name, all the elements that I care about. Now, Linda, I have a question for you. So here I have a streaming API and object model API. What is the recommendation for developers? Which one to use when? Well, clearly the streaming API is going to be more efficient insofar as you're not reading entire objects into memory to manipulate them. You're just searching for the particular data items that are of interest to you. On the other hand, if you do need those objects, for example, because you might want to create references between them, then, then the object API is definitely the thing to use. That is a good tip. So tell us more about what do we have in HTML5 theme. Well, the Java API for WebSocket, or WebSocket 1.0, is another key technology for HTML5 support. The WebSocket API enables highly efficient communication between client and server WebSocket endpoints over a single bi-directional and full duplex TCP connection, where the connection is held for the duration of the client-server session. The WebSocket API offers a very convenient annotation-based approach to writing WebSocket endpoints. So if you look at the code snippet here, this illustrates how you might define a server endpoint for a chat application. Notice that in the server endpoint annotation, we can even specify the URL at which this server endpoint is going to be accessed. The onMessage annotation is used to denote the method that's going to be invoked when a message for the endpoint arrives. The definition of a client endpoint is very similar. It uses instead, however, the client endpoint annotation. For either case, there's also a programmatic API that allows you to drop down to dynamically control the configuration and the communication. Using either the annotation or the programmatic approach, you can also define callback handlers for lifecycle events. For example, when a connection is opened, when a connection is closed, or when there's an error. WebSocket server and client endpoints and their associated classes can be conveniently packaged and deployed using the standard Java EE approach. So in the server endpoint example that we see here, you could simply package that into a WAR file. That's a great explanation of WebSocket 1.0. Let's hear from Belgium Jug, who organized a hackathon on exactly JSR 356, where they arranged a hackathon, they learned about the technology, provided feedback. Let's hear from Johan Vos from Belgium Jug. We started by writing a simple tic-tac-toe game in Java. We used Tyros, which is a reference implementation for JSR 356, and which is also part of Glassfish 4. So the server was built on Glassfish, and the initial client was built in JavaFX, where we used the Tyros client jars. And during the hackathon, we added a few other clients. Uh, at the end of the hackathon, I think we were playing tic-tac-toe with, of course, the JavaFX client, an HTML5 client using Angular, an Android client, and an iOS client. Um, we encountered a few issues with uh, Tyros, and we submitted them. And good enough, all of them were resolved within a few days. So that clearly shows that the developers working on the specification and the reference implementations are listening to input from the community. I heard Johan saying that as part of the hackathon, the Belgium Jug wrote four different clients for the tic-tac-toe demo. HTML5, JavaFX, iOS, and Android. Is that correct? That is correct. You know, these clients were able to talk to each other using standard WebSocket protocol deployed on a Java E7 SDK endpoint. That's great. Can we see this? Absolutely. So here what you see is two game boards. This is a tic-tac-toe game board here, as you can see. 
Um, you want to play a game? Sure. Okay. What do you want to do? Uh, I'll take the O. Okay. And where do you want to place it? Uh, upper left, please. Upper left. So I'll give you upper left. Okay. So I noticed that the other side saw the O almost immediately. So it looks to me like what we have here in terms of architecture are two clients that are talking to the same server endpoint that's coordinating the game. Is, is that correct? That is correct. This is actually a hub and spoke model where all the clients send their feedback to the server endpoint, which then broadcasts to all the clients listening. Now, in this case, I'm running the two clients locally, but these could very well run across internet very easily. Sure. OK, so your move. OK, so I'm going to, I like winning tic-tac-toes. So I'm going to place my cross here. I'll take the lower left. OK, lower left. You get lower left. Uh, you're going to lose. Oh, I'm going to block you right here. So I'm going to block you. I'll take the middle then. OK, you got the middle. Oh, of course, you're going to block me, which is by clicking here. Uh, OK, oh, finish it. OK, finish it. <laughs> okay. well, I try to block you here. and then you gonna get it. Okay, you win, Linda. Okay. Now, the game is fun. What I want to highlight is this contribution from Belgium Jug was all the more relevant because it actually contributed to Java E7 SDK. This entire sample is bundled as part of the SDK. You can look at the source code, build it, and run it yourself. So once again, I encourage you to download SDK and try out these samples. That's great. I know we have a lot of really good samples in there. Yeah. Uh, now, tell me, is there anything else in the HTML5 theme? Well, JSF has also been enhanced in support of HTML5. Previously, all attributes used for JSF components could only be those that were understood by JSF itself. With JSF 2.2, JSF now adds HTML5 friendly markup support with its new pass-through attributes and elements. These allow you to list arbitrary name value pairs in a component that are passed through directly to the browser without interpretation by the JSF UI component or renderer. HTML5 adds a series of new attributes for existing elements. These attributes include things like the type el attribute for input elements, supporting values such as email, URL, telephone, range, date, even color. And there are also data star attributes. So in the code snippet here, the input text element is bound to an EL expression, and we're using a pass-through type attribute. So can we see this one in action? Absolutely. Now here on my browser, what you see, you know, two behaviors. One is the behavior of uh, index.xhtml in the JSF land that is before Java E7, and one is the behavior that is after Java E7. So if I click on before Java E7, let's say I want to enter my favorite color, I have to write red here. I'm going to have to really write the text as such. That's not fun. That's not very intuitive. Now, if I go back with HTML5, as you said, you know, we have those type attributes. Let me show how that is uh, available mm -hmm. in the JSF now. So if I say with Java E7, as you can see, now this is a color palette. So there's still the same input yeah. text box. But now when I click on this, my local color palette from my operating system pops up, and I can pick and choose colors here. So would you like to pick any color here? Sure, let's do red. So if we go to the color palette, we can pick the red color here. And you can see how the visual feedback is given to you. Yeah, this is great. Let me show you the code behind this. As you can see here, this is the same text that we showed in your slides. Mm -hmm. So I have an input text you know, bind, bound to an EL expression. The key thing that you want to look here is p colon type attribute. Mm -hmm. Now, this p is a new namespace in JSF 2.2, which is called as a pass-through namespace, which says, take this attribute as is, pass it to the browser, and then the browser will figure out meaning of it, mm -hmm. which any HTML5 compliant browser will render it correctly. So, Linda, I think that is great news for HTML5. What are we doing in other themes of Java EE7? Another focus area of Java EE7 is an increasing developer productivity by continuing our trend in offering simpler and easier to use APIs and in offloading developer tasks onto container services. JMS in particular has undergone a major simplification with a JMS 2.0 release, which is part of Java EE7. Sending and receiving a message using JMS 1.1 required a lot of boilerplate code. JMS 2.0 has really fixed this with the addition of the new JMS Simplified API and, in particular, the JMS Context Interface. The JMS Context Interface combines in a single object 
the functionality of both the connection and the session of the earlier JMS APIs. You can obtain a JMS context object by simply injecting it with the inject annotation. There are many other simplifications in JMS as well. To mention a few, auto-closable JMS context, session, connection, JMS producer, and JMS consumer objects, the use of runtime rather than checked exceptions, the use of method chaining for JMS producers, and simplified message sending. There's no need to create a separate message object, but rather you can specify instead the message body as an argument to the send method. So Arun, can we cut over to the demo? Sure. Now, JMS 2.0 has classic API, which is a JMS 1.1 API, which is the older API. The new API that has been introduced, as you've been talking about, is a simplified API. I'm going to show you the code sample on how sending a message looks like using classic API and simplified API. Let's take a look at the classic API first. So in this case, you know, you can see, you know, it's a stateless bean. I'm injecting my connection factory, first of all. Then I'm injecting my destination here. I just have a method send message that can be called by other Java EE artifacts. Now in this method, if you realize, I am getting my connection from the connection factory. From connection, I get session, from which I get producer, from which I get text message. And then finally, line 71, which is where I need to send the message. That is the crux of my message. I have to do write all this boilerplate code just to honor the API the way it was designed 10 years ago. And then I have checked exceptions. I got to handle them. For example, in my finally block, even when I'm closing the connection, there are checked exceptions. So there's a lot of boilerplate code mm -hmm. I need to write to get this rolling. Now let's see how all of this has been simplified as part of simplified API. This is it. This is the simple simplified message sender. In this case, as you see here, I'm just injecting my JMS context, which is the new API, the entry point to the new a simplified API. Then I have my resource here. You know, the destination, of course, needs to be injected. And then my same send message method on the context, as you said, method chaining. I create my producer, mm -hmm. and I say send to the destination and the actual payload. So not only the code is simple and easy to look at, it actually improves semantic readability of your code. Indeed, it is very clean. And I want to point out one other thing in this example, namely JMS context. There's no connection factory anywhere that we're seeing in this code, whereas you had to inject it with resource in your previous example. And again, as a further simplification, in Java EE7, we've introduced default JMS connection factory bound to the JMS provider available in the environment and a default data source correspondingly for data source. The JMS context object really simplifies your life because here it is making use of the default connection factory for you. So there is no need to even specify that layer of API call. So very simple, very clean. That is great. Now, where else have we cut down the boilerplate code? Another area where we've made huge improvements is in the APIs for invoking a REST endpoint from a Java client. Up to now, you've needed to do this in a low-level way by establishing a connection using the HTTP URL connection API, set up all the metadata, do the data binding, error checking, and so on. The new JMS 2.0 client API avoids this kind of grunt work. Instead, you can use a simple, fluent, builder-style API to invoke on the REST endpoint. Can you show us? Absolutely. Now here, I have client builder as sort of my entry point to the JAXRS client API. Typically, you will do HTTP mm -hmm. URL connection, but just by using client builder, I can say, give me a new client instance. Once you get a new client instance, on that, you can set the target, which is the REST endpoint that you want to invoke. Now, you said Fluent Builder API, so let's take a look at that. I want to invoke a HTTP GET request on a REST endpoint, so I say target, builder request, on the request, issue the get request, issue the get um, mm -hmm. um, uh, request. And then I'm also specifying the type information, that is, return to me as an array of person. And that's it, just a simple clean API, all the data binding, etc. everything is happening under the wires, all the error checking, everything is automatic for you. Now I want to do invoke a HTTP get request with, say, a variable parameter. Then I say, OK, to the target, which is what I define, mm -hmm. I'm going to add a variable path now, and then I'm going to resolve the template, saying, OK, specify mm -hmm. a value. Now, I'm calling it here this way, but typically this is where you would start parameterizing it or sure. call it in a loop. Same thing, build a request, and then fire a get request. 
not just get we can easily do HTTP post as well using mm -hmm. this client API for example in this case I'm just doing a multi-valued hash map specifying the name mm -hmm. values and making a HTTP post we have support for get put post delete all the standard HTTP verbs as part of the JAX RS client API indeed this is very clean and I think it will be intuitive to anyone who's already familiar with JAX RS excellent now let's hear from Antonio Goncalves he is the Paris Jug leader DevOps France organizers, Java champion, and Java EE consultant. We recently released Java EE 7, so I'm, I'm here to tell you what I find exciting about this version. The coolest thing for me in Java EE 7 is that uh, CDI is becoming a central part of the, of the platform and is spreading on other specifications. Let me give you two examples. JTA. It has been updated to a 1.2 and it has a new annotation called at transactional. You put that on a bean and you get transactions. This annotation has been implemented as a CDI interceptor binding. Uh, same thing with the at transactional scoped which has been implemented as a CDI scope. So CDI is heavily used in JTA. The other example is JSF 2.2. The managed beans have been de uh, uh, deprecated and you should now use the at named qualifier. Same thing, the JSF scopes have all been deprecated and you should now use the CDI scopes. And, J and JSF has the view scoped and the flow scoped. These two new scopes have been implemented uh, with CDI. There's other examples of uh, uh, CDI being used in other specs. So take a look at Java E7, start building some apps, enjoy, see you. And Antonio has also been a member of the Java E7 platform expert group and a number of our other expert groups. So he's been a very valued contributor to this release. As you heard from Antonio, managed beans, which support dependency, injection, and interceptors, are at the heart of the Java EE component model. CDI plays a key role here in going beyond the earlier Java EE managed bean functionality. Also, CDI is now enabled by default in Java EE 7 without the need for you to specify a beans.xml descriptor in your module in order to avail yourself of CDI managed beans and injection capabilities. As Antonio noted, we've also added two new CDI scopes and we've more strongly aligned JSF with CDI. We've also augmented the CDI interceptor facility to make interceptors more widely available to manage beans, and we've added new transactional interceptors as part of our work on JTA 1.2. We've also introduced the priority annotation, which can be used to order interceptors, and this avoids the need to do this ordering in an XML descriptor as you had to previously. Interceptors also provide us with a mechanism for supporting the automatic validation of method arguments and results, which itself has been added as a new feature by Bean Validation 1.1 API. So let's cut over now to another demo. Absolutely. Now here, in what you're seeing is my data bean, just a simple pojo here. And on that data bean, I have a new CDI scope called as transaction scoped that really ties the life cycle of this bean with the transaction. So the bean is created automatically by the underlying runtime when the transaction is started and destroyed when the transaction is committed as well or rolled back. Um, in this bean, I have a simple method called as get ID. The string representation of that actually gives me the object identifier. And let's see how I'm gonna use that method in my transactional bean where my business logic sits. Now, this is a POJO. You, know, you can see there are no annotations on it. In this transactional bean, I'm injecting the data bean, which we just looked at, twice. Or I'm at least attempting to inject twice. Now, this, this POJO has three methods, scenario one, scenario two, and scenario three. Scenario one and two, they have a transactional annotation on them. Now, this is a new annotation, as you said, coming from JTA 1.2. 
the semantics are implemented as standard CDI interceptor bindings. So there is nothing additional you need to do. That's part of the Java E7 runtime. That means these methods will inher inherently run in a transaction. The third scenario, of course, does not have a transactional, so it doesn't run in a transaction. So in this case, what happens is if I run scenario one, even though two instances of the bean are injected, but because the bean is tied to a transaction, it's only injected once. So as a result, when I say get ID on bean one and bean two, it prints the exact same mm -hmm. identifier. Just the fact that scenario two is running in a different transaction now, the bean identifiers are exactly the same, but they're different from scenario one. And in the third scenario, for example, here, when I try to get the bean identifier, because there is no active transaction, the runtime or the CDI runtime cannot inject the bean, and as a result, throws context not active exception. So Linda, what else is new in this theme? Well, default resources. Now, the Java EE platform has long required that a platform implementation, or a Java EE product, provide a database and a JMS provider in the environment for use by applications. We've made the access to these services easier to use by now adding the requirement for pre-configured default data source and JMS connection factory objects for JDBC or JPA in the case of data source and, and the JMS connection factory for JMS. Um, in our earlier example, we saw how this default JMS connection factory was leveraged to simplify the APIs with JMS context. For the new concurrency for Java EE API, we've also added default executor services, thread factory, and context service objects. Now, all these things are indeed going to contribute significantly towards developer productivity. Mm -hmm. So that's good news for that as well. Now, Java EE is very well established in the enterprise market. What are we doing to meet the enterprise demands for the developers? Another new API in this release is the concurrency utilities for Java EE API. This is an extension of the Java SE Concurrency Utilities API for use in Java EE container managed environments. This is so the proper container managed runtime context can be made available for the execution of the concurrent tasks. So this container managed runtime context comprises, for example, the naming context for use with injection or Jindi, security context, class loaders, and so on. This API provides you with asynchronous capabilities for your Java EE applications at a lower level than the existing APIs that are offered by EJB, Servlet, and JAXRS, and thus it gives you a finer grain level of control and configuration. You can define your own runnable and callable tasks that can be invoked using this API. The Concurrency Utilities API provides you with four types of managed objects. The first three of those shown here correspond to the Java SE concurrent APIs. The context service object allows you to convey a component's managed runtime context through to additional execution points where this context would not otherwise apply. So it gives you more flexibility in the configuration of your tasks. Now that is indeed a great news. I know developers, you know, whenever I go visit worldwide, they've been asking for concurrency utilities I'm sure all of them are super excited now. Now, you mentioned two APIs. What's the next one? Right. The second one is batch. As you heard earlier from IBM, the ability to execute batch jobs from Java EE is very important for many enterprise customers. The new batch applications for Java API is therefore targeted at non-interactive, bulk-oriented, long-running tasks. It allows you to customize the handling of these jobs in terms of their individual steps. You can specify sequential or parallel execution, as well as specify decisions that direct the execution path. The batch API also provides for checkpointing and callback mechanisms. Now, an individual batch job step may itself be a chunk, whereby you can specify separately the handling of the input, the processing, and the output of the individual items that are part of the chunk. Or a step may be a batchlet, which provides you with a more roll-your-own style of the step tasks. Since chunks are expected to be the more commonly used style of execution, will we take a look at that? Sure. The entry point to any batch is a job XML, which is what you see on the screen now. This is a simple job, which has a single step, although in a typical real life, you will have multiple steps with a complex workflow. This is a chunk, and as you said, it has a reader, processor, 
and a writer. So let's look at those artifacts now. Now in my reader, for example, I have an open method where I can initialize my streams. Read item is the method where I will read a particular item of the chunk. Similarly, my processor, you know, it's, this is where I'm going to take my input record, perform validation on it, process it, and return my output record, which could be completely different, by the way. Mm -hmm. And finally, all of this gets aggregated in my writer, which is right over here in the list parameter. So this is where I can write all the items out you know, if I want to. So that's very straightforward. Um, can you show us how we execute this job? Sure. Now I'm showing you a simple test servlet, which is where I could launch this job, but you could do this from a very any Java EE component. Batch runtime is uh, my entry point to starting the job. So to the batch runtime, I say, give me a job operator, which knows about all the jobs existing in my archive. Then I say, job operator, start the job. When I say start the job, I pass it the name of the file. So my job.xml, for example, this is my job.xml. I pass that same name here, mm -hmm. and I start the job. And over there, I have, uh, once I return the job ID, I can use that to start, restart, cancel, or abandon the job. That's great. Thanks for the demo. Thank you, Linda. Those are great technical details on Java E7. I'm sure the developers are very excited about this. Yes, I sure hope they will be. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. It's been my pleasure. Now, you saw lots of technology demos here as part of the technical keynote. What is equally important is a comprehensive tooling around it. Of course, we provide that as part of NetBeans and Eclipse. As a matter of fact, the NetBeans tooling is available for download today, and Eclipse, an early version of the plugin, is available as well. Let's take a look at how NetBeans provides extensive set of templates, tools, and wizards to get you started and make you more productive right away. NetBeans IDE 731 provides the tools, templates, and samples to help you get started and be productive with the Java EE 7 platform. Out of the box, the IDE enables you to create Maven-based or Ant-based applications conforming to the Java EE 7 specifications. While creating your applications, you can specify that they should be deployed to Glassfish 4, which is bundled together with NetBeans IDE 731. New templates and wizards have been added to the IDE to let you quickly and efficiently create code conforming to the new Java E7 specifications. For example, you can generate a template to get started with the new Java-based JAX-RS client. The IDE generates code that uses the new JAX-RS client API based on the latest insights and techniques in the Java EE platform. The generated code is clean, simple, and easy to use. Also, when JMS messages are created, the code leverages CDI for the first time via the inject annotation. Notice also that the messaging code has shrunk from around 20 lines to just one in JMS 2.0. To support the new HTML5 features in the Java E7 platform, NetBeans supports all the syntax enhancements in JSF 2.2, such as the HTML5 pass-through attributes, together with Expression Language 3.0 in the editor workflow. Also, to support HTML5 integration in Java E7, NetBeans IDE lets you quickly and easily work with WebSocket endpoints. It provides a wizard, code completion, and documentation to help you get started. You can create powerful applications via WebSockets quickly via NetBeans IDE. JSON APIs can be used immediately with code completion and other features out of the box. When learning about Java EE 7, NetBeans IDE is the ideal tool to use. And the show is not over. There are technical breakout sessions happening across the themes of Java EE 7. Specification leads are available waiting to answer your questions in live scheduled chat sessions over there. Thank you very much for the listening to us, and I will see you on the chats. <laughs> <laughs>